worship with me. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life, you're the king of my life. You reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the work was finished. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem arise, cause Jesus, you're alive, oh, you reign above it all, you reign above it all, over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name, Jesus, you reign above it all, let all of heaven in song sing hallelujah to the everlasting one there is no higher name jesus you reign above it all you reign above it all you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone in glory enthroned on the highest praise you sent the darkness running out of an empty grave now seated alone Welcome to Cornerstone Online. I'm Pastor Brian Foreman, and I'm so glad that you are with us today. This is our online experience where we inspire and equip you to follow Jesus wholeheartedly because we know that following Jesus makes life better and makes you better at life. If you're new to Cornerstone, we would love to be able to welcome you personally and more importantly, to send you updates and information and encouragement. So if you would let us know, you can start by going to our website, cornerstonenh.org, click on where it says start here, or you can also text new to 603-225-2550, our church number. And that will allow us to keep in touch and to update and encourage you along the way. We are so glad that you are here today because we are continuing our series, The Best Advice I Ever Got. And I hope that today will be helpful and encouraging to you. Hey, Cornerstone, I'm Jonathan, and this is Joy. Can you stand with us in worship? <laughs> power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much 
much stronger The king of glory The king of love walking Who shakes? Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder chapter and says that we're going to face persecutions, that we're going to face trials and hardships, but then he ends it saying that he's convinced that nothing will ever keep us away from the love of God that we experience in Christ. He says, in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer by him who loved us. So as we sing, let's remember that he is worthy because he conquered everything so that we can conquer too. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your Especially right now, there's a lot going on and everybody is feeling a certain degree of anxiety and fear and concern and we feel like we're on the edge sometimes. The reality is that while this phase in our community and in our country might be a little bit more like that, the reality is that everyone will go through something like that at some time or another. Fearful, anxious, 
worried, concerned. And in the midst of that, what do we do with that? Well, number one, I know that we all need a little bit of extra grace. And when we encounter people, whether it's in the store or on the highway or in our own household sometimes, we need to extend a, a little extra grace and understanding because it's a difficult time and people will go through difficult times. And when we're going through a difficult time, we want, we need a little bit extra grace and understanding. And in the midst of whatever you may be facing, whenever you're watching this, some people might be watching or listening to this long after this phase is over, but everyone is going to go through a time where we're feeling a little anxious, feeling a little concerned, feeling a little fearful and need extra grace. And the good news is that as a follower of Jesus, we can tap into an incredible source of peace and grace when we need it. For a follower of Jesus, this is just some of the promises. I'll give you a couple of examples. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, I'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. In other words, I'm going to give you a peace that you cannot find in the world, in your circumstances. Sometimes things are going well and we just are, are just, you know, gliding along and everything is going well. That's when we have peace. But he's saying, I will give you a peace that the world and its circumstances cannot give. And so he tells us, so, because I've given you this gift of peace, don't be troubled or afraid. That's pretty much our world, is troubled and afraid. But he says, I'll give you a peace that is not based on what's going on in the world, and you won't be troubled or afraid. Another example, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, says, don't be anxious about anything. Paul, you don't understand my situation. I, I mean, everything that's going on in the world and in my life is causing this anxiety to arise within me. How can you say, don't be anxious about every, anything? And then he promises that the, if you uh, follow through, if you present your request, if you pray through it, that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just another incredible promise, a, a peace that comes from God that transcends all understanding. It doesn't even make sense. And then just another example, what are the kinds of things that a relationship with God produces in our lives? This is Galatians 5, 22 and 23, talking about the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace. It's going to go on, but I just want to highlight that one, joy. How many of you are just, it's your normal, natural state to be in a state of joy. He goes on, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit, the person of God living and residing in them and producing these kind of fruit, this kind of fruit in their lives. That's what we should be experiencing. And in fact, according to the scriptures, if we live uh, in the Spirit, if the Spirit is producing this kind of fruit in our lives, that not only will it, ex it uh, produce this kind of peace and all of these other things, but it's actually going to prompt questions from people. This is Colossians 4, 6, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail in just a second. But it says, let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, what that implies is that as you live your life, it's going to be so out of the ordinary, so unusual, so uh, divorced from what's going on and what would normally be produced in your life, that it's going to prompt questions that you're going to have the chance to answer. So it's not just that our circumstances and what's going on in the world are going to 
naturally produce these kinds of things. Not just that the Holy Spirit is going to, God's, our relationship with the Lord is going to produce something else, a totally different kind of response. It's actually going to be so different that it prompts questions and people will wonder, how can you be at peace? How can you have such joy? Why, when everybody else is impatient and unkind, you're full of patience and kindness. That's what it's supposed to look like. But if we were honest, we would have to say, you know, I, could, I would have to say, there are times when my life doesn't look like that. When we look around at people who are following Jesus and it doesn't necessarily reflect that kind of character, that kind of peace. So, how do we get there? How do we get there? I've been studying the Psalms lately, and this one really stood out to me. It's Psalm 11. Uh, I've been studying the Psalms in my devotional time. It starts out like this, In the Lord I take refuge. The idea of refuge, it's the language of trust, that I put my trust in the Lord. I run to him for refuge. So how can you say to my soul, flee, run away? You know, uh, everything is so bad, it, it, you've, got to, you've got to escape. Uh, and then it says, behold, the wicked bend the bow. That's Behold is an old fashioned word for see, look. It's like the, the bow is bent, the gun is cocked. People are aiming at you to do you harm. And then it goes on and says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? In this whole introduction to this psalm, he is saying, look, things are bad and getting worse. It's time to flee. It's time to run away. People are aiming to harm you and the foundations are being destroyed. The idea there is that that all the things that we counted on, all the, the foundational bedrock things that we were counting on are crumbling under our feet. What are we going to do? It's a hopeless situation. And so what is the, the prescription for this? Well, it started out by saying, in the Lord I take refuge. And when everything is falling apart around us, the next phrase is this. The Lord is in his holy temple. In other words, he's in control, he's still on the throne, he's still ruling and reigning. And so, as we think through what's going on in our lives, perhaps, and think through what's going on in our world, the things that it would naturally produce, and wonder how can we have that supernatural response to what's going on, so that we, in turn, can express faith, confidence, joy, patience, kindness, the fruit of the Spirit to those around us, then we need something that is going to ground us, that is going to shore up those foundations that will convince us and comfort us with the idea that the Lord is in His holy temple. So in this episode of the best advice I ever got, I'm thinking about and talking about our motivation. In other words, what, what is prompting the way that we are responding uh, to our circumstances and to others around us? And this was not advice that I read in uh, just any book or heard somewhere. It was actually, again, came out of my devotional life and I ran across this phrase in Romans 14, 23. And it says, that anything that does not come from faith is sin. Anything that does not come from faith is sin. And here's how I thunk that, thought that through. So whenever I face such a situation, a situation that is causing anxiety, that is causing fear to rise up within me, sometimes we want to respond out of that. We want that to be the controlling, it becomes the controlling influence. Not our faith, not wisdom, but fear becomes the controlling influence. And then we do stuff that's sometimes not helpful and we respond in ways to other people that is not loving or kind. 
However, if I remember this and I think about that, okay, anything that does not come from faith, if, if I'm motivated to do something and it's not based on trust, it's not based rooted in my foundational faith in and relationship with the Lord, then that should be a red flag. It should cause some tension in me that I need to recognize and pay attention to. So we're gonna be looking at motivation and Romans 14, 23 is going to form the bottom line for today, that anything that does not come from faith is sin. This is gonna be so helpful because as you gauge your own response and the motivations for your actions, you'll be able to step back and think, am I responding out of fear? out of worry, out of anxiety, because most of the time when I make decisions based on those things, I am going to be hasty and I'm going to make a mistake. But if I step back, slow down, and examine things from a faith perspective, not listen to all the voices that say, flee, run away, the gun is cocked and it's pointing at you, what are you going to do? Do something that I can say, that the Lord is still in his temple. He's still on the throne. He's still in control. There's a passage that, from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Colossian church that I think gives us some good insight and good help with this particular situation. It's Colossians 4, 2 to 6, and that's the key passage that we're going to look at. So I'm going to read that, and then we'll walk through it together. Colossians 4, 2 to 6 says this. The Apostle Paul has written this letter. He's wrapping it up. These are his closing exhortations. He's just talked about how they should relate to one another within the church, and now he's going to talk about how we relate to others in the world. It says, Colossians 4.2, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about this, his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would speak to us through your word, that you would help every single person who is feeling anxious and concerned, and sometimes legitimately so, and that they would be able to find in you a supernatural peace, that they would experience that gift of peace that the world cannot give, that is not even logical, that it's based on a supernatural comfort, assurance, and trust in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason that I want to look at this particular passage is that I think it gives us kind of a uh, a track to run on so that we have the right, that kind of relationship with our Heavenly Father that in turn flows out in right relationship and peace with ourselves and also right relationship with others as well. Uh, and I see in this passage three particular steps. It's pray, which is where you get faith. Again, remember, Anything that does not come from faith is sin. Walk, that's where we live out our faith, and in particular, in front of people who perhaps don't yet have faith. And then talk, and that's where we share our faith. So let's look at it together, beginning with praying, getting faith. In the very first verse of this passage, it says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Let me peel back the curtain for just a second and tell you that one of the main things, my main thing throughout this whole series, the best advice I ever got, is to encourage and equip you to have a devotional life. What do I mean by that? 
I mean that every day, each one of you is reading and responding to God's Word. Because all of the advice that we're talking about is great advice that came from God's Word. And that is going to be so helpful. And as you get to know God's Word, you're going to get to know your Heavenly Father. Because ultimately, this isn't about advice, it's about a relationship. And as you walk through life with your Heavenly Father in right relationship because of what Jesus did for you on the cross, He will mentor and apprentice you. That's what being a disciple means. And He will lead you and guide you in the right path for you. And so in order to do that, you've got to, you can't have a relationship with somebody if you don't spend time with them, if you don't get to know them. And so the Apostle Paul encourages the people at the church to devote themselves to prayer. Prayer, I highlight it, because prayer is where we express our heart to God and we go away hearing God's heart towards us. It's communication and it's a two-way conversation. Notice the things that he points out about prayer. What should it be like? That we should have an alert mind, wakefulness, alertness. Uh, one of the best things I ever heard about prayer was from the Experiencing God study that said, when you pray, pay attention to what happens next. That it uh, never occurs to me to think uh, that, that it should be, that it never occurs to me to pray and not expect that God is going to answer that prayer. And so we're alert when we pray for something. Just pay attention to what happens next. Be alert and watchful because often God will answer that prayer, bring something to mind, an experience will happen, a connection will be made. So we need to have an alert mind. And then he says, with a thankful heart that we are going to be thankful in the midst of it. Now, sometimes that might be just remembering things from the past that will help us, uh, that we can be thankful for, that are going to remind us that God does answer prayers, that he has come through in the past, and so that will build up our faith. It could be also talking about once you put a petition out there and you get a response, to respond with gratefulness and gratitude. You might remember at the beginning that don't be anxious about anything. Well, instead of being anxious, what are you supposed to do? Here's the rest of that verse. But in every situation, how many situations? Every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. What's the cure for anxiety? It's to lay all those things that we're worried about and concerned about at the feet of our Heavenly Father. Prayer with thanksgiving. And secondly, back in Colossians, after he encourages them to devote themselves to prayer, he adds a prayer request of his own. Pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. Now, that's kind of a fancy, elongated way to say, help us stay on mission that we want to be on mission. What's the mission that God gave to the Apostle Paul and to every believer? It's to get the gospel out, to tell the story of Jesus, to be a witness to what Jesus has done, who he is, that he is the, the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is God in the flesh, fully man and fully God. What did he do? He came, he lived among us, he lived a perfect life, he went to the cross dying a death that he did not deserve. What does that mean for us? It means that we can have forgiveness and life that we could never earn. That is the message that we have been given. And the Apostle Paul, who is imprisoned, by the way, under house arrest. Think of all the things he could have asked for prayer. Help me to get out of this situation. But his main concern was that he would be able to speak about the mysterious plan concerning Christ. What's mysterious about it? It's the mystery of Christ. Just means that we didn't know about it before, but now we do. It's not that it's mysterious. It's not that it's hard to understand. More about that in just a second but that we're going to take every opportunity, that God will give us many opportunities, literally open doors, 
And that's what we should be concerned about. There's so many things that we could be concerned about, but we, if we're going to be a people on mission, have to be looking for, praying for those open doors and being on mission. And this brings me to an important point, that if you're going to have a relationship with God, you need to understand and be a part of the mission. Those, the, the gospel, the mystery of Christ, the message of Christ, that he is, who he is, what he has done, and what it means for us, we have to take that and apply that personally. If you're going to have peace instead of anxiety, if you're going to have joy instead of worry and concern and a furrowed brow, then Jesus is a necessary step because it's only as you put your faith and trust and run to him for refuge that you are going to be able to experience that, that the Holy Spirit is going to live within you and reside in you. And so I'm going to encourage you to commit your life to Jesus, to say yes to him, yes to his forgiveness, that what he did on the cross is going to count for you, yes to his lordship, that you're going to follow him, you're going to be apprenticed by him, you're going to turn your life over to him. And if you do that, let us know. Click the button if there's a button on the platform that you're watching or anywhere, anytime, text YES to 603-225-2550. Then we'll be able to celebrate with you as you begin your new life in Christ and encourage and equip you for what's next. So look at what the Apostle Paul says right after that. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should, as clearly as I should. In other words, yes, it may be a mystery because we didn't know about it before, but now it has been revealed. He says, let's reveal it as much as possible. Let's make it as clear and unencumbered as you possibly can. The early church encountered a situation where the gospel was spreading outside of Jewish circles. And so the question arose, do I have to become a Jew before uh, or a, a Follow, follow the Jewish religion before I can become a Christian. So the, the early believers, leaders of the church got together, talked it through and decided, hey, God is not only revealed his story and given his Holy Spirit to we who are Jews, but he's expanded that to Gentiles, to the whole world. So if God is okay with it, then certainly we've got to be okay with it as well. And James, the leader at the church of Jerusalem, put it this way. This is Acts 15, 19. It's my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We don't face that same situation, but we often will try unfortunately, and sometimes in unintended ways, to put a barrier up and say, first, you've got to do this before you can follow Jesus. First, you've got to get your life cleaned up. First, you've got to believe like we do, or vote like we do, or think like we do, and then you can be a follower of Jesus. And so we got to be careful about that, because we don't want to put any unnecessary barriers. We don't want to make it difficult for people who are turning to Jesus. And sometimes we can do that with the way that we act and we think about and we talk about things and put these barriers up that are unnecessary and unhelpful. And so we gotta be on mission. And then secondly, it's a walk. We're gonna live by faith. If anything that does not come from faith is sin, then our life should reflect a walk of faith. Here's how Paul puts it, the next verse, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. We gotta be wise about the way that we talk and live and think and put uh, things out there. We've got to be careful because uh, everybody is looking at us and making a judgment about Jesus based on what they see in Jesus' followers. So we need to live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Again, there are going to be open doors. There are going to be times and opportunities. And if we are on mission 
And if we are aware, if we are devoted to prayer, alert, thankful, then we're going to see those opportunities and be able to respond appropriately, to take the opportunities. The, the picture there in the, in the original Greek is that you're, you're shopping in the marketplace, you find a bargain, and you snatch up that, part, that bargain. It's a carpe diem, seize the day, seize the bargain, make the most of every opportunity. And we need to be aware, we need to be living wisely so that we are making the most of every opportunity. And then there's the talk side of things. We need to live wisely because our lives are being evaluated. They're going to be reflecting on Christ, but also we need to talk. We need to share faith as well. In the last verse in this section, it says, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Let's talk about what our conversation could be like. What, how do we talk about others? How do we talk about people that we don't agree with? What do we post on social media? Maybe it's not our words, but we're copying and pasting or linking to someone else. Are they full of grace? I love the introduction to John where it talks about Jesus saying that he was full of grace and truth. In other words, there's a way to be fully truthful and 100% gracious at the same time. What if we evaluated everything that we said? Not only is it true, because you can say something that's true in an unloving and ungracious way, but is it full of grace as well? Our conversation is supposed to be full of grace, attractive, literally seasoned with salt, that, uh, that there's something attractive and compelling and desirous that when I have a conversation with someone that I want to continue the conversation, I want to spend more time with that person, I, I, I'm drawn to what they are saying. That's the idea as well, so that you'll have the right response. You, make a, a, uh, you take advantage of the right time, the opportunities that come up, and you respond in the right way because different people are going to require different responses to depend on what they're going through, who they are, what their perspective is, to answer not everybody just the same way, but to tailor the response to the person and to the situation. See, because here is my concern with the situation that we're going through right now and kinds of situations that we're likely to encounter for a long time. I don't want the people of God to be disconnected from the life of God, not devoted in prayer, not checking in with God, making decisions based on fear and worry and anxiety, being just like everyone else, full of anxiety, full of unkindness, full of impatience, uncharitable with their words, spreading lies, rumors, unconfirmed information, all of these different things that we see going on, there should be a difference, a difference in the way that we think, in the way that we talk and walk, the way that we live our lives, so that when people look at us, that it prompts uh, the right kinds of questions. We have an incredible opportunity everywhere we go, open doors. But if we just copy and duplicate the pattern of the world, then people aren't going to ask questions. In fact, we can turn off people to the gospel. We can cause unnecessary barriers to people even considering the gospel. We can, we can build walls instead of tearing down walls between us. And what, and when we get off mission, then we're not accomplishing what Jesus had in mind for us. We are disconnected. We are responding out of fear and anxiety instead of faith. And then we see all these negative consequences that flow from that. But what if, what if in the midst of the worst times in people's lives and the worst times in our culture that there were instead a people that are so connected 
with their Heavenly Father, that are in constant communication, devoted in prayer, getting His thoughts and His perspective on everything that goes on before they respond, that are turning over their anxieties and fears so that they can, in turn, respond with grace and kindness and encouragement to those who are fearful and anxious, who can rise above what's going on and experience a supernatural, not based on the circumstances, peace in the midst of everything and anything that they face. So much so that when people look at them, it's just almost eerie how they rise above all that's going on in their lives and in the world around them. And people come to you and say, how can you be so at peace? How can you be so joyful? How can you have such trust and such uh, confidence in the midst of everything that's going on? And as a result, we get an opportunity to tell them that it's based on Christ because we cannot do this on our own. And good advice, don't let fear rule the day. But ultimately, we can't do it on our own. It's only because we have Jesus living and residing in us, living his life through us, that he, we run to him to refuge, that he, we know, is on the throne. That's the only way that we can have that kind of peace. And when we do that, we'll have people coming to us saying, how can you be like this? Show me how, teach me how I want to follow Jesus. I want to have the kind of peace I want to be as patient, I want to be as kind as you are. We can't do it on our own, but I believe that as we come to the Lord and cast our cares upon Him because He cares for us, that He will give us that supernatural peace that He's promised. That when we face decisions or we think about how we're responding, when we feel that fear and anxiety rising up within us, that we can instead turn our lives, turn our concerns, turn our cares over to him and that he will bear them and in turn give us the gift of his peace. That's what I hope for us. We have a tremendous opportunity. We have open doors before us. Let's seize the day. Let's walk through those open doors. Let's experience peace. Let God give you that peace that you lack. And then let's be kind and display that peace and patience and kindness to the world around us. I'm going to challenge you with this challenge. It's a simple step. Devote yourself to prayer. I, I told you at the, towards the beginning that what I really want for you is I want you connected to your Heavenly Father so that you can experience that supernatural peace. I... I'm going to point you to this page on our website. 1098 is the serial number, the number for this message. And I will put resources there. You'll find resources there that are going to help you to make that connection on a regular basis so that God can give you that gift of his peace. Uh, let's spend time reading and responding to God's word, opening ourselves up to him so that he can fill us up with his peace so that we can be on mission and share that mission with the world. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray, Lord, that whatever is going on in the lives of people who are watching and listening, that you would give them your peace, the peace with God that was purchased for us by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that we would experience that day in and day out, that we would be on mission, and that we would be sharing that faith. That when we encounter decisions, that we'll be able to reveal and see what our motivation is and whether we are being motivated by fear or faith and respond in faith. And I pray that you would apply this message to every person just how they need to hear it, that they would know what you want them to know and do what you want them to do. Pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.